So it's highly plausible in this entire scenario that just on the lads' points that the FAI did want Martin O'Neill to sign this contract. They'd spoken very um, in very glowing terms about him, according to O'Neill himself, when he had come out and made that video a few months back saying that a new agreement was on the table that he had agreed to, but yet to sign. Like, it's possible that the FAI really wanted him to sign that, but that he wasn't willing to. And from the FAI's point of view, almost at that stage, like, what do you do? Well, I, I think the problem is it's just the clarity. I think we spoke about it the other day that perhaps one side or another could have made a statement just to, to give us that clarity on to, to what's been happening. But this has been ongoing now since that Denmark game. This, we, we've actually we've brought it up a few times on, on, on various shows that we've done. Why, why hasn't it been signed? So it always leaves it open, particularly when we speak about it because the Everton job came about and Sam Allardyce came and went. That was after the Denmark game. Martin O'Neill was it was was it was supposedly um, sounded out for that job as well. Again, we don't know that's only rumour. Don't, don't get me wrong. But this one now, there's certain there's certain certain contact that has been made, and we've had we've had no clarity as to as to what is actually happening uh, regards the FBI or Martin O'Neill, and that's what just makes the uncertainty and creates this uncertainty. Richard Dunn made made a few strong points last night as as, as regards for as regards to the fact is well. Where does it leave the FBI now? I think it does leave the FBI in, in a compromised position going forward. They can come out with, with, with a statement and they can try and redirect it elsewhere to say, look, yes, they may, they may, uh, we, we, we would have allowed him to go somewhere else if that was the option. But I just, I think it, put, it doesn't put anyone in great light here. That's the only thing because, because of this just gentleman's on, on agreement. On that, Kevin, right? How does it compromise them? So if he's saying, I, he had said all along to the FBI, right, I'm, I've, I'm agreeable to take on this contract, and I will at some point take it on, right? Let's assume at some point over the last few weeks that the FAI have been in contact with Martin Eden and said, listen, we'd really like you to put pen to paper here. And he said, that's fine, I'll absolutely do that. And then at some point, obviously, the Stoke thing comes up. So that they're not going to say to Martin Neal, OK, you haven't yet signed this, sign it now, or we're moving on. I, d I, I don't think that, that would have been good business. I think the FAI would have copped all sorts of uh, flack if a manager they wanted, they'd put that sort of pressure on to the point where he'd have ditched out. So in the meantime, the Stoke gig comes up and he's within his rights to go and speak with them. Like, just in terms of that point about the FAI being compromised, I can see a fairly plausible scenario. We don't know the details in the background, but I mean, it seems like a plausible scenario that they wanted him to sign and he was just stalling. No, 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 you, you spot on with what you're saying, but where does it leave them with, with, with not getting him to sign that contract? two, three months ago when that contract was supposedly on the table. Why hasn't it been signed um, so early? We, we, I, and again, it goes back to the, to the original point. I think it was Dan McDonald made it the other night when he came on when he came on uh, the evening show with us. Basically saying, well, this was the same scenario uh, ahead of the Euros and um, ahead of the Euros in 2012. He didn't actually sign his contract till or, or post, uh, post Euros till actually after that Serbia game. Mm. It just... I, I, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying it's not it's not retrievable because it, it is a retrievable situation. I think that that is the case. But they are compromised, of course they are, by not signing that contract uh, two two or three months ago. Whenever that was agreed before that Wales game, um, it, it's left them open to this sort of scenario. And now all of a sudden, it looks as though Martin O'Neill, if 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 we believe what we're reading, then he was keen to actually move on. And I just think then it just it just it puts the FBI in a position where they think, well, hang on a minute. Um, are you committed to us or not? That's, that's the only thing that I'd be thinking about if I was the FBI. Just on that point of the previous instance where there was some confusion about whether or not a contract was or wasn't signed, that tells me that this is something to do with the relationship with Martin O'Neill specifically because I don't remember any other manager in the history of the Republic of Ireland's national team that have had these arrangements with contracts where there's a verbal agreement months before the thing is actually signed. So this would suggest that this is more Martin O'Neill than the FAI maybe. Is that fair to say or am I forgetting some other instances in the past where the FAI have done this with other managers? No, I, I don't recall them doing it with the manager. I think you're spot on. It's, it's certainly a Martin O'Neill thing. It's um, it's definitely something that he has he has said on record. It, it's a verbal agreement. The agreement's in place. The contract will will, will be signed and, and sealed. And that may be the case. That may be the case. That the comeback can always be. I was ne uh, there was never any intention from uh, for me to leave. It was always going to be that way. But it is definitely uh, Martin O'Neill who has. Uh, I'm sure if that contract wanted to be signed. As I said before, two months ago by Martin O'Neill, it could have been signed. It's t the, the ball's totally in his court through this, yeah. From a player's point of view, Kevin, so there's been a, some conversation about, you know, he's been linked with Stoke, he's gone out of a conversation with him, and somehow this uh, undermines his position 
with the Republic of Ireland if it ends up that obviously Flores gets the gig and O'Neill remains on and does eventually. I mean, it's plausible that O'Neill could end up signing that uh, FAI contract next week. It's not an unlikely scenario. So there's been some conversation about him, his position being undermined by having this conversation with Stoke. I kind of think it might actually be the opposite, that in the players' eyes, they're looking at a guy who's been four years in the gig, who's done pretty well, it has to be said, in terms of qualification and almost qualification, um, that actually he's been linked with a half-decent club in the Premier League and it almost endorses him. Yeah. You know as well as I do, Adrian, how it works. The players won't give a hoot. They're not bothered. The players will not be bothered about Martin O'Neill, whether he were to leave or not. They're, they're, they're literally trying to concentrate on themselves, particularly now at club level. The the, the only thing, I, and, I, and I think I've spoken about it, I think, the other night, it's just that little bit of uncertainty. If a new manager were to come in, it's an uncertainty around themselves. Once you become established with a certain manager, is the manager going to pick me going forward? But the managers, will, the, sorry, the players will not be bothered one way or another. They really won't. The, the only the only thing it's maybe from the outside is looking in. It's how committed Martin O'Neill is. That's the only the only point I think um, that support. That it'll be more the supporters yeah. uh, that would have the concern. The players won't be bothered yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, and that's kind of that's isn't that almost the most the entire and biggest most the most important point in this entire conversation? Because like ultimately, it's not going to damage his standing with the team. So ultimately, if he does sign the new thing next week, who cares? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, that, that is true. But I think it'll all be used as a, as a stick to beat him with going forward, though, won't it? That is the thing. How committed were you to this job in the first place? This, If Martin O'Neill were now to go on and sign the contract, which, which again, it's still highly likely that he will do, this this will be this will be brought up, won't it? You know, you know as well as I do how this will work, how this will play out in press conferences, that why why then did you go did you go and speak to Stoke? Why then, if you were committed to the Republic of Ireland job, did you go and speak to Stoke at that particular moment? Um, that that's the thing that'll be used against him, and it'll just create a little bit of edginess. I would say more edginess around press conferences. That's that's the thing that I I can see just happening further down the line. That will be that will be used several times. I mean, it won't be several times by several maybe journalists at various times throughout uh, throughout the next campaign. Yeah, but it's kind of a ridiculous argument because like, he's in totally, from his point of view, entitled to go and speak with Stoke. And like, it demonstrates that a decent club in the Premier League are interested uh, in our manager. Like, that almost legitimizes him. I just kind of think it's... I'm, it's I, I find it a frustrating argument because like, ultimately, it's it's football, right? Like, what sort of loyalty are we expecting here? Well, that, that is that, that was maybe my original point. I just think it's it's the FBI will will, will face the uncomfortable the uncomfortable questions here. It won't necessarily be Mark, Mark O'Neill can can back this off as much as possible. He'll be he'll be quite fine about it. And you spot on what you say. This is just the way that the game is. Uh, every single player, and, and we spoke about it. Players know themselves how the game works. They know that when they go away in international duty. That they're being they're being tapped up by various players' agents. Can you come with me, uh, my agency? Can you come with me? I might be able to get you a move to X or Y club. That that's how it works. And no matter what what people think and how um, and how people um, uh, think the game is done from the inside, that's exactly how it works. It's not it's not exactly um, the uh, the clearest of business. It is a bit shady at times. That's the way that it works. And 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 I think even John Delaney will know that himself. But I just think the questions that will be asked will be of the FBI and I think they'll they will just find themselves in an uncomfortable position going forward. I, I just want to kind of question that uh, question of legitimacy and legitimising Martin O'Neill being linked with a Premier League job. It, how does it legitimise him? I know this is kind of challenging your point, Adrian, but Kevin, if you, if you want to just talk about like the international management aspect, because Stoke City want him to come in and do a job with the club team. Martin O'Neill has proven he does very, very well with club teams. When he gets a transfer window and buys the players that he wants for his system, he's almost been on the record, I think, in, in saying that he doesn't have the players with Ireland and therefore has to play this system that has got him so much criticism with the Irish public. I'm not sure if I buy this idea that going to a Premier League club or being linked with a Premier League club actually legitimises him as an international manager. Uh, well, it, it legitimises him as a manager. I think, um, I mean, Adrian made the point earlier on, certainly gives him a lot of credence. It, it shows how highly thought of Martin O'Neill is, certainly within, within Premier League circles. Legitimising him as an international manager, I think... I think ultimately, I, I mean, I was I was watching a little bit of Sky yesterday. I was watching, uh, and, and the things that the common thread that was coming through is Martin O'Neill did a great, has done a great job with the Republic of Ireland. That is the mm -hmm. common thing that's coming through. 
so I don't think in taking the Irish job, I don't think his, his reputation has been diminished whatsoever. I think it's been enhanced, certainly, on uh, on the UK side of the water. And that ultimately has enhanced his reputation within Premier League circles. That's what I was going to say, that it might be a difference of opinion on this side of the water than it is over there. Uh, ju just like on a final point on, on that with regards to the Stoke job, will Martin O'Neill's pride be hurt at all by any chance if this story is true this morning, that Flores is indeed their number one choice and Martin O'Neill is a backup? Oh, you tell me, your pride's been hurt overnight, uh, Owen, so <laughs> I don't know. That, that's maybe something. I, I, no, seriously, I, I mean... Uh, it's football, baby. Well, if it is, it is I, I don't know, there's, there's nothing more to say to it than that, Adrian. That's the way that it is. Managers go for jobs. Players players know full well when they're contacted by agents. They might be number two down the pecking order. If a certain transfer doesn't go through, then then they'll be the number two, they'll be the go-to guy. That's exactly the way that it works. Look at Sam Allardyce. Well, Sam Allardyce's pride hurt when he was number two or even number three for the Everton job. He bided his time and that's just the way that it works. Uh, the big other part of the storyline is the number one choice, Kike Sanchez Flores, and he came out after Espanyol's win last night and didn't exactly say that he was, uh, he didn't quite commit to doing one thing or the other. But anyway, we had Gillian Balague, the, Balague, the uh, Spanish football writer on the show last night, needs some things to say about Flores. Approach halfway through the season, uh, uh, an approach that is, uh, it makes him, you know, put him in a crossroad really because. The target of Espanyol when he first arrived was to uh, to get Espanyol into European places and eventually into the Champions League. And uh, he's in target to do that this season, in a way, uh, even though some results have been disappointing. So now in the quarterfinals of the Cup, it's becoming a decent season. But uh, he feels that some of the promises that Espanyol uh, gave him when he first arrived with the new ownership that the club has have not been delivered. So he is getting what Espanyol uh, has but uh, and what they can give him but not what they promised. Which means that, uh, in a way, uh, it has been a very frustrating 12 months for him. He thought he was coming to a, to a club where he could go and buy some of the players that he wanted. He hasn't been able to do so. And, and now it's not so much about getting into the, uh, the top four as, as originally was in the plan. It's more about you know, trying to get to European, the European League or something like that. But it's not, uh, it's not the, the Espanol that he wanted. So with that in mind, you know, once Stoke comes with, and it's not about money, but it's about a, a project that is very exciting. It's, it's, it, it will be very, very difficult to say no. And Stoke are very hopeful that uh, he will say yes. Yeah, again, Balagu on the uh, show last night. And so we should see how that pans out. I mean, I think that we could probably expect expect some sort of developments today. I'm kind of, we're talking about the FAI, and I'm actually one of the questions that interests me the most is if Martin O'Neill is still being paid right now. That's probably the, because that would actually give them some fight in the here we need a bit of compensation if he does end up going i doubt it i whether that we don't know obviously we don't know mm. but i would if there's no contract on the table is he still in contract when did his contract expire it's done post the ending of the previous campaign so you would suspect not but like yeah. it's anybody's guess sorry i would imagine it would be some something if he isn't being paid it'll probably be backdated when he probably signed the contract i would imagine that'll be um, right, we're going to move on from that. We have a couple of comments in. Niall Keegan, ah yes, lads, why would you want rid of your only, uh, your only proven winners in the Ireland setup being O'Neill and Keane? Makes no sense, says Niall Keegan. Players will only improve with the top manager. O'Neill is the best we can get. So there's certainly an element of that. Sam Sam, meanwhile, says, I don't consider O'Neill to be a lame duck. That said, is there a vast difference in skill between Iceland and Ireland? I'd think not. Uh, as the comment disappears off my screen. But they seem to be able to play a much more expansive team-focused game. What gives? So Sam Sam, well, we shall find out uh, what that, how that develops over the next while. We have a poll running as well about whether you'd be disappointed or delighted to see Martin O'Neill uh, leave. 64% at the minute say they'd be disappointed if Martin O'Neill stays. Wow, okay. So that's the anti, uh, the anti O'Neill. Well, the other option was relieved, not delighted. Yeah. A so. um, couple of other things, Kevin. Like, this is normally the uh, chicken shit slot that we have. I don't know where the chicken is, actually, this week. He seems right to have you're, you're not getting your hands it off, uh, off screen there. I'm not allowed to have him. Nathan not fancy getting up today. Nah, he was he fancied a lion, Kev. You know, these sort of rock stars, uh, you know, start presenting off the ball a couple of nights a week and suddenly it's, you know, pick and choose what they want to do. Um, so, we just a couple of things before we let you away that we want to get your thoughts on. Uh, one of them being VAR, which was introduced during the week. I mean, I only watched the Palace-Brighton game on Monday night, really. I'm not lie to you. I only watched it for, the v for VAR, just to see was there going to be any sort of a decision. I know that's a sort of a despicable non-football man type of thing to do, Kev, but uh, yeah, and I ended up getting nothing, as it turned out. 
There's been a lot of conversation about this week. Chris Hewton was the comment that sort of stood out for me where he talks about, look, there's not going to be much improvement here. It's only tiny percentages that we're talking about. Why would we bother doing this thing at all? That's actually the stated aim of the entire VAR project, that it would take what, you know, the initial, the current situation is that referees say they get 96% of decisions correct. This would take them to 98. I don't see much of the uh, downside, I have to say. Uh. No, I'm, I'm probably with you. I'm probably with you to an extent. I, I just don't want the game to be to be slowed down too much. Um, I think Jamie Redknapp and Terry Henry with it were in studio in the Sky Studio for the uh, the Arsenal or the Chelsea Arsenal game of the night. They were talking about perhaps it, it can be a little slow in relation to the the penalty incident. I think it was Danny Welbeck made a challenge, and and in fairness, the game carried on. It went. It, it, wait, um, it was um, Martin Atkinson. He waited for the for the corner. And then he took his time in making a decision. I think that that is the only thing with with slowing down the game. But I'm, I'm with you. I, I think it, we, we look at some massive decisions that have gone on over the last few years, and we look at some of them that could have been could have been avoidable, could have been prevented. And I think if it, if it eliminates those those real contentious decisions, those real big decisions that that affect that, that can affect um, championships being won, that could affect uh, tournaments being won, then I, I think it has to be there. Of course, it has to be there. And I think. We only need to look at goal line technology. I think there was a certain element of negativity towards that. It's quick, it's easy. I think it's, it certainly enhanced the game when goal line technologies come in. So I, I'm all for it. I think it has to stay, yeah, most definitely. I think it took like a minute and 20 to get that review done the other night. And uh, Conte was on the yeah. sideline giving it this one that he was sort of straight away. He was ready. He got his, his hand terminology oh. all ready for action. We had uh, we had Alan Kelly on the show the other night. And apparently that's a bookable effect. Uh, offense. Oh, really? If... if, if Referees and players give that sign to the officials, then apparently that's a bookable offence. They, they, they're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to <laughs> so not hang on, hang on, hang on. So you're allowed to go up to the referee and, like, I've seen this a lot, actually, uh, over recent weeks. It's not been unique to that, but it's really stood out for me. And abuse the referee from a, an unbelievable height. Like, the sort of language that's being used is incredible. But you can't do this. Yeah, well, apparently that's the thing. You're not oh, allowed to try and influence the referee by by, uh, by trying to make, make him go, go up. Because from what Alan was saying the other night, Alan was saying every single decision is being reviewed over and over again. They're constantly reviewing every single decision that's been made in the lead up to the goals. So if something does come up, and then they make the, the referee um, aware that something is, it was amiss and something's not quite right. So that is the, that is the overriding thing from it, really. The players are not allowed to run to referee to try and influence them, and the coaches and, and managers on the touchline are not allowed to either. Yeah, like the only concern I have for VAR is that like great football men, the likes of Richard Keyes, who's been tweeting about it during the week, are just waiting for one mistake, and that's the problem I yeah. have. That I think like if there's going to be any small glitch in this thing over the first few weeks, and it's a trial period, I think it's just going to end up having a bullet put in it. Well, I mean, did you not do the, the the one thing? I don't know if you, you did you did see it, and I mentioned it to to Alan the other night. He hadn't actually seen the incident. It was the uh, the Turin derby. It was Juventus and, and Torino. There was uh, uh, in the Coppa Italia uh, last week. It was I think, or just before the internet, the, the the break. There was a, a massive foul in the build up to the goal. Clearly, see it. Um, the VAR official has, has said to the the referee on the pitch, "Look, there's, there's a big incident here. You need to come and have a look at." So he's gone over to the touch line, and he doesn't make the decision now. This is the one thing I, I think where it will create that little bit of uncertainty. They're saying it's it's as you say, it's only a small percentage. Apparently, the decision making has gone from ninety eight percent correct to ninety sorry ninety six percent to ninety eight percent correct. So they are still going to get things wrong, yes. But I think a majority of the time it actually will be right. I think it just will be a bit of a storm when um, when they get one of these decisions wrong. But I think I, I, I'm just I'm just a little bit concerned about the time. That's the only thing. Why does the referee? For every single incident or any any major incident, need to go over to the touch line to have a look. Why can't he trust the VAR officials up in his ear to say to him, "Look, that was wrong. You need to call that back." There was a foul in the build-up. I think that should be the case, but ultimately, by him going over to the side, I think that then adds another two or three minutes onto onto the clock. I think that's what happened with Atkinson during the week, wasn't it? He stood in the penalty area and he let somebody else review it, and like it was a minute and odd for a hugely significant moment in that game that. Done it, done it like very clearly said it wasn't a penalty. I think that was half to do with the fact that the play had moved on a good bit after that, so the VAR got a good head start. Mm. So the ball was in play for what, 90 seconds or thereabouts afterwards, so the VAR yeah. had that time. But the constant reviewing, 
Uh, it should, it's something that they often say we should be doing more of in rugby before they go to the TMO. But it's good to see the VAR start off on the right foot, isn't it? That they're actually getting that process done uh, as things are developing, that the VAR has the wherewithal to actually go and check things out if they think yeah, it's yeah, a suspect. Yeah. On, on, while, while play is ongoing, I think that's an absolutely sound point. One other thing we want to talk to you, Kev, about uh, Liverpool and uh, the fact that are they a selling club, I guess, is the, is the question here. I mean, it's a difficult one because they've you know, bought Philippe Coutinho for, I think, eight and a half million and then Barcelona come in for 140 million odd whatever it is like most clubs in the world are going to sell I mean if it's Real Madrid or Barcelona themselves most clubs in the world are going to sell a player for that kind of profit yeah you only need to look at the best players in the world invariably end up at Real Madrid and Barcelona you only need to look at Cristiano Ronaldo he was exactly the same uh, don't necessarily see it like that you look at what and how they have improved um, Nabi Keita of course he will be coming in next summer the, the money that spent on him last summer and Van Dijk coming in now they are still they have still got a lot of money to, available to them um, certainly during this transfer window and into the next I, I don't think it, do, it looks unlikely they'll be able to get some sort of replacement in at such a short um, in, with such a, sh a short window to, in this transfer window left now I think they'll just go ahead for the next window I think they'll be very strong next year Liverpool but ultimately I mean, I, I think Liverpool will be strong. Nathan and I are on uh, commentary this weekend, actually, for the for the Liverpool Man City game as well. So I'm looking forward to, it, to see how Van Dijk uh, gets on, certainly in this in this type of game. But ultimately, not I, if 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 the big clubs come in and it's a Barcelona. I mean, Graham Souness has touched on this in the past himself. If if you're a South American player, Barcelona come calling, you're going to want to go. That's that's the reality of it. I don't necessarily see Liverpool as a selling club because of that. Not even enough time to get into Brendan Rodgers' um, great text that he got from Felipe Coutinho as he was arriving into Barcelona. Kev, we enjoyed your little flashing of the off-the-ball mug there a bit earlier on. Well done. Yeah, good man. All the best, lads.